Hi, and welcome to the Dowi Expert Series podcast. This is my second interview with Gary Bickett. Gary Bickett is a Scottish American martial arts and Qigong teacher who spent years in Beijing, China, studying both the martial arts and Qigong at the Beijing Institute of Physical Education. In our discussion today, Gary covers a number of interesting points, not only about his background, but also about his extensive uh, experience working together with various organizations such as the UK National Health Service and also similar American entities in researching and promoting Qigong as a viable therapy for elderly people. This is a tremendously interesting discussion since this area of Qigong is very important to the overall development of the genre as a substantial healthcare medium which can be used with practical applications in society rather than its current status as a hobby of people who are interested in uh, obtaining energetic well-being. Of course, as a hobby, it's also very important and Gary is certainly passionate in that department. Uh, Gary Bickett is a tremendously talented practitioner and teacher with a great wealth of personal experience. So we were very lucky to have two interviews with him, this time focusing mainly on his experience in Qigong. Thank you very much for choosing to join us on the Dawi Expert Series podcast, and I hope you like the episode. How's it going, Gary? Uh, very well. Thanks, mate. Yeah, we were just saying the uh, part one went on a bit and we... we... We put a lot of the world to rights, but we didn't even get close to the Qigong side. So it's it's a pleasure to be back and chatting about that. Yeah, that's right. And and because you're a multidimensional human being, not just kick punch, kick punch, um, we're going to talk today about this wonderful world of uh, energetic cultivation. So number one, straight out of the, um, what do you come out of? I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to ask you the most difficult question. What is Qigong? Right. So that's a really good question. And it's one that um, I think it stumps a lot of people for various reasons. It, it stumps them because of the, the opinion and the way Giles mix up sometimes. And it stumps them because Qigong now is many different things to many different people. Um, but I think you you know from your research, the, the, the reality of Qigong as a term is pretty recent compared to what the the exercises that we practice under that umbrella now. Um, so for for me, basically, the Qigong I, I've studied is for medical benefits, but also for martial benefits. And it was never, none of my teachers ever shrouded it in the mystery. It was a very simple practice that was a case of, if you do this and you feel better and there's discernible results, then why not keep doing it? So for me, the, the Qigong that is now, for my practice specifically, is um, basically based on the principles of Qigong, which is sometimes static, sometimes uh, dynamic in, in its nature. But it has those com the components of the breath control and often utilizes like a, a mental focus on whether it's a given meridian or a specific right down to a, a specific acupuncture point. And then marrying all those those concepts together to create a practice. Um, and as I say, it's it's become a vast, vast area now of of differences in, in what people say and what people do about it. And I, I said this in the last one, as long as you understand what it is your goal is and understand how you're trying to get there, then uh, I think it's it's a very sound practice. Um, did I answer your question? Did I do a politician ramble there? <laughs> um well uh, you know one of the things that the reason i think why it's difficult to answer that question is because qigong is so many things to to so many people it is and yes since since it's something that you know you can really get interpretations 10 ways from sunday as they say um let's let's narrow it down a little bit so you mentioned that you're doing practices which are, are medical so they're health-based and they're martial and so if I understand correctly, Qigong is broadly categorized into, let's say, three really big buckets. One is uh, medical, one is martial, and one is spiritual. Mm -hmm. And so when you practice Qigong, um, your goals, which are medical and martial, what is it that, what is it that you do in those practices? 
Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So for going back to, to what we discussed in part one a little bit, the, the medical side, um, I specifically studied uh, the system Daoyun Yang Shengong, which was created by Professor Zhang Guangde. And he was a, a professor at the Beijing Sports University now, Beijing Physical Education University prior. Um, and his system of Qigong was born out of his knowledge and need, essentially, because he struggled with some health issues, pretty much as, as a lot of the, the generation coming up after the foundation of the, the Republic did. Um, his family had limited resources and he, you know, there was limited health care. And he used his knowledge in terms of what he wanted to learn to try and achieve and also to try and get his health back. So he kind of coupled his like growing up with some martial arts practice and basic wushu and seeing like the, the Tai Chi and everything else and seeing the health benefits and that. And he wanted to go a little deeper and um, but also try and build the bridge a little bit to Western medicine because we still struggle to, to get credibility, I think, in, in the West. And I totally understand why. And we'll, we'll maybe get into that a little bit later. We're, we're sometimes our own worst enemy with it. Um, but so for, for the medical side, the Daoyuan Yang Shengong system basically was a, a, in, in its goal was to target organ systems and the meridian system specifically to try and on, on a very basic level, smooth those meridians out and clear blockages. And again, in, in the in the TCM world, the tra traditional Chinese medicine world, that's your goal of everything. Um, it's not always as simple as that in, in the theory, but it, it's basically if there's a blockage or if there's a, a imbalance in energy flow, then that manifests as illness in any number of, of ways. So from that point of view, from the medical side, it was really to to study this system and try and understand it a wee bit more. And um, coming from a, a Western side, my degree from, from the Western side is in sports medicine and physiology. So it's it's a fascinating arena because I've seen plenty and I've done enough anatomy labs to know there's no meridian. When you cut someone open, you can't pull out the meridian and be like, and here's the lung meridian running down the arm. There's, there's no such thing as a, as a physical structure. But if you look at case study and history of, of traditional Chinese medicine, it has vast benefits. And you can't always say you, there's no therapeutic index involved in doing Qigong, but it's something that works, which goes back to my, my earlier comment of a lot of my teachers would say, if this works, why would you not do it? It's, um, so from the medical side, that's where I was really trying to trying to come at it from. And it's paid off in, in, I think, in terms of bringing that back from China. I, I've been able to collaborate and integrate it into my Western side of practice, whether it be sports injury, rehabilitation. Um, more recently, I was working with special health populations. Then, and that was a, like breaking those populations down. We worked with diabetics. We worked with cancer patients, cancer survivors, they were still undergoing treatment. Some had po be post-treatment. Um, a program I designed myself that was piloted through the, the YMCA of the USA was uh, a program for morbidly obese. So people with a BMI of 35 and up. And we were looking at all these different aspects of fitness, diet, nutrition, uh, almost like a group therapy, but also for trying to get some mind-body connection and Qigong was way more accessible as a mind-body practice than some of the other modalities at, at this point for, for certain groups. Um, so for me, it, it's it's I've put it into practice. And again, it's you put metrics on it as best you can. The scientist in me needs metrics because I always be data-driven, Robbie, always. And it's it's one of my my favorite things to, to do is be data-driven because then you can see it. And even even if you're driving in reverse back it up with data. So it's one of those things that when you put metrics down, plus the anecdotal evidence, you can get a, a very solid picture of, is it actually working? Are you doing any any good? And you know, have, have you spent your time wisely learning a system? So for me, that the medical side is that, and that's the, the real, the Dao Yang Shengong is a side I, I still 
practice almost daily if I can, and I still teach uh, often. Um, and it's what's mostly filling my YouTube channel as well, if, if people ever want to have a look at it. It's pretty, again, it follows the basic principles of Qigong. One of the, the things that may be not so common is there's a lot of spiraling movements built into the, the dynamic side of it. And again, it's purely to stretch out and smooth where those meridian systems are and, and ultimately clear any blockages that are there. Um, so that's like the, the medical side. Again, we can, we can go into a little bit more uh, probably if, if we've got time for detail. The martial side, I think I mentioned it in, in part one. The first martial aspect of, of Qigong I had was the Zhuang of just standing. And as a teenager, that's a tough, <laughs> a tough concept to grasp because you go to a martial arts class and then in your head, as I, as I said before, prior to that, I'd been training judo and karate and it was just, it was all in. When we started to slow things down and uh, started practicing Zhuang, and just some of the basic standing postures at that point in time, you don't initially understand until you then hold a stance or a structure. And then it all just, you're like, oh, okay, that that's why we were standing in a very specific manner tightening the tendons rather than using musculature you obviously need the muscles to to hold the, the stance or the pose but trying to rely on on tendon strength as well and from that aspect the martial side really uh it really clicks in as i say even from just a basic stance or if you block a solid block is very different when you're you're using structure and to go back to Sing Yi in particular, which is an art based on alignment and structure, and that's how you're going to achieve your goals. The the Jan Zhuang side of Qigong is invaluable, um, particularly for San Ti. A lot of people don't understand San Ti is, is a form of Jan Zhuang in, in the sense that you're standing with a purpose. And it's the root or the foundation of everything that grows up from, from there in, in Sing Yi in particular. So from the martial side, uh, the static Qigong was great. And then as I progressed through, I started to learn more of the, sometimes defined as harder Qigong, the Shaolin styles, like the, the uh, tiger and crane, where you're using, again, not a new concept in the West, but it just put a, a different name on it. But it was basic dynamic tension exercises where you're using isometrics. Um, and sometimes it's, it's dynamic isometrics where antagonistic muscle pairs are working against each other. And sometimes it's just static isometric holds. And that really, again, it strengthens your body in a, a very different way than just traditional progressive resistance, which is also very important. But if you don't strengthen the tendons and connective tissue in particular, you go to lift heavy or push someone or hit someone heavy, then you're going to have a solid muscle structure, but you may end up tearing out tendons, which is a, a much longer injury to, to repair and rehab. So... These things from, from my journey in particular seem to, to go very well together. And it, 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 as I say, it paid off um, later on as, as, I, as I worked in the industry of, of health and wellness, basically. Right on, this is really interesting. Um, I, one of the things that you mentioned, and I wanna latch onto it because it will allow us to have a, an even more interesting conversation. <laughs> As you mentioned that when when you do anatomical dissection, you can't find a meridian system. There's no physical infrastructure, uh, at least insofar as things which are, are visible and mm -hmm. could be defined anatomically as a meridian system. But let me let me push on that idea a little bit and see what you think. So in um, because meridians mean different things to different people right, insofar yeah. as uh, let's say Chinese medicine or Taoist, or ancient Yangsheng life-nurturing practices, or modern Qigong, or the martial arts, they all view these things a little bit differently, right? And then one of the things that I, I wonder if you can give comment on is what um, traditionally, if you look at the so-called 12 standard meridians or 12 upright meridians, um, usually they say that there's six meridians running down each of the limbs. And they go from most exterior, most exterior to most interior. Mm -hmm. There's three on the outer portion and there's three on the inner portion. And in a sense, it kind of defines 
um, rather than defining a piece of physical infrastructure, which is like a band, it defines more where the empty cavities are located along the connections of muscles and connections of joints. And it, it sort of almost defines an interior to exterior relationship of multiple structures in the body. And I'm wondering what you think about that idea of a holistic view of the body, which incorporates many structures rather than an individuated piece by piece anatomical view. Yeah, no, it's it's a good point. And it's again, it's one that that I think people kind of struggle with sometimes. And again, it's one that 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 stops us making that bridge to integrate Qigong almost as a as a daily practice in so many Western clinics. Um, but again, from from what looking at it from from the the structure of the qigong practice anatomically yes it's it's like you say it's going all the way to the extremities which is an awesome concept because you want to ex extend your focus to the extremities um and again this is a, a relationship of chi and blood which is if one flows the other flows and, and basically in, in the chinese medicine world if you don't have one you don't have the other so there there is a, a a connection to the western side in that aspect in terms of if you get blood to the extremities then obviously that's a very healthy thing to do um the anatomical side i would suggest is for me personally i i prefer the more holistic view when you start to just say one thing exists and other things don't it becomes it becomes a little difficult because then you you almost have a confirmational bias in your outlook of everything, and you'll always try and seek to to support your argument. But again, if if you look at case study and if you study the history as, and I'll give you a shout out for this, I know you've delved into it deeply to find out what existed before what we now know as qigong, whether it was Dao Yin or the Yangsheng Health Principle, the the principles and the exercises. If you go back that far and you look at the way the practices were and why they did it. It was purely based on, like we're trying to stimulate this meridian as as a as a concept. Whether it's the lung meridian, whether it's the the like the the gallbladder, whichever one you're working with, they had a goal of of smoothing that meridian from start to finish, as you say, from like either like in in here out right out to that thumb tip, and. If if you have people with enough case studies, you can look at the problems that they had, you can look at the treatment that they were given and you can look at whether that helped them or not. And um, so I think it's it's an interesting concept. And it's one that for me, as I say, coming from a Western side was always a, a fascinating one. And it was part of the reason that I, after my my studies as a postgrad, I went to, to China to study because I wanted to try and delve deeper into it and see why this holds so well even though there's no what we know in terms of physical Western medicine, we don't always include all these kind of aspects. Now, as as medicine, we talked about it a little bit last time. I think just the two of us we were chatting. As medicine has evolved, even in the Western side, there's concepts that were around a couple of thousand years ago that people swore by are great. Some of them still exist, and some of them were like, "Whoa, let's never do that again." So it's it's an interesting concept. That it's not everyone has all the answers. I don't think we're all still, hopefully, still evolving and still progressing with knowledge. Um, so I think it's yeah, I think it's it's good to have that that structure of understanding, but also keep reading and keep researching as best you can because again, it's it's going to evolve and someone's going to find out something new. And for if this is your industry, you want to obviously try and keep up. Yeah. One of the things that really interests me is that since the 1970s, maybe, there have been quite a lot of researchers in China trying to understand what qi is, what yeah, the physiology yeah. of qi is, and so on. And sometimes they do really cool research, but sometimes they come up with pretty, pretty, uh, let's say, ideas which are a little bit lacking. Because yes. you get these ideas like, oh, qi is uh, based on the exchange of nitrogen during uh during cellular breathing or something like that and it just seems like it just seems like it takes a concept that doesn't map that well onto uh onto a reductive view 
and it tries to fit it into a re reductive view in order to verify itself. But we can feel it when we practice. So it's it's interesting. I wonder, you know, as a person who does who who lives in both worlds, right? I kind of live in one world, but you you manage to live in both of those worlds of the biomedical knowledge and the traditional uh, medical knowledge, because Western traditional medicine is not so different from from Chinese medicine. No, uh, no. The, I wonder if you can kind of make a, a comment about how how you've experienced the issue of having to having to talk to people in a way that legitimates knowledge according to their understanding while not sacrificing you know not throwing the baby out with the bathwater so yeah to speak. absolutely yeah yeah so it is as i say it's it's a difficult bridge to build sometimes and um, because as going back to that my comment about confirmational bias it's a really it's a difficult path to go down to to change what you believe or change what you've learned and maybe spent a lot of money and time learning um but if there's value in it then this is this is where i try and try and bridge so particularly for some of the if for, for example when i was working with special health populations for uh, diabetes prevention and, and diabetes treatment and it, at that time this was about uh almost just over 10 years ago now and the the us was looking at however it could to try and increase awareness and education on diabetes because at that point there was some around 79 million people were pre-diabetic which were leading to type 2 which potentially can lead to type 1 but either way it's 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 usually um it means drug treatment and it means a very difficult road back however in that pre-phase there's a point where potentially you could reverse where you are as long as you you maintain a, a, a specific kind of lifestyle. So what the CDC had the, the diabetes prevention program sponsored and it's very well supported in Western medicine. The view of diabetes from a Chinese medicine perspective is, is very different in terms of causality. But if you look at the symptoms, they present almost, as you said, there's so many similarities, they present almost the same, the exact same way. And then the treatment is obviously very different than and using Qigong specifically, there, there's no drugs involved, but if you add that into your overall plan, and again, it has to be complementary. It can't be Qigong will cure you of everything. It, it, it sadly won't. Otherwise we'd all be doing Qigong and be super beings. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, but if you can integrate it into your other practices, um, and that was one of the, the battles we had. And, and again, based on case study and metrics, it was one that we could show the benefits for to both sides. And um, whether it was the, the TCM practitioners that we worked with and tried to integrate them into the clinics and also from the, like a CDC perspective, encouraging them to increase uh, their, their knowledge and awareness and willingness to look into other things. And, and it worked to a, to certain degrees like there's another program that the cdc sponsored and um, called moving for better balance i don't know if you know that one um it's tai chi that's it nice. it's basically it's, it's a hybridized uh version of tai chi and it's based on eight basic movements from the form like part of the wild horse's mane repulse monkey so, so just taking simple movements but it was it was awareness from the cdc to say that not everyone's going to go to a tai chi class for two years to learn a form. So let's try and incorporate something that is based on the principles of Tai Chi, because we know that Tai Chi as a fall prevention program is effective, but we're trying to get it to, to more people because again, looking at what causes hospital stays in a certain age population, falling and and um, whether it's outside or in the, your own home, was a big, a big risk factor. So the CDC um, began with Tai Chi moving for better balance and it, it was a, a solid program. It rolled out, again, this was a few years ago. It's probably still going. I haven't, I haven't checked back in for a wee while because I'm not entirely engrossed in that side of things at the moment, but it, it was a solid program. So there was that willingness to, to branch out um, and, and try and incorporate it, not just in senior centers, but also in hospitals for rehab, for someone who was post-fall, so either OT or 
PT, we're trying to incorporate these exercises, which were basically Tai Chi. And you could argue that if it, if it was almost like a Qigong side of it, because it was a sort of very small compartmentalized aspect of it. Um, so there is, there is hope. <laughs> There's still a long way to go. Um, and I think if, if we go back to what I said earlier about us being our own worst enemies, the belief that it's a, an all encompassing system and a, a cure all is, is just, it's unfortunately not how it is in reality, out in the real world. Um, working with, with the people on the Live Strong program, which was for cancer patients and survivors, the Qigong undoubtedly through metrics helped them with regaining balance, regaining um, postural control, potentially increasing their immune system, but it certainly didn't annihilate the cancer that was that was that they were being treated for. It made them tolerate a lot of our participants. It made them tolerate the chemo or radiotherapy slightly better because their body was a little healthier. Um, but it's, it's definitely not the answer. Um, and I caution people often to this, that it's, you have to understand the reality of it. Um, I, I, I've gone into <laughs> two arguments many times and, and most recently I, I had to just explain to someone who, who their, their opening gambit for Qigong was how about when you wake up, you don't take that pill this morning, you do Qigong instead. And th that, and you you put that out there and that will immediately discredit any Qigong practitioner to a Western medicine practitioner or a clinic or the the the, the greater community because it's it's massively irresponsible to do something like that. Um yeah. always is complimentary, always on the clearance of a of your physician or your specialist who's working with you. And as long as we understand that, we can we can make massive, massive grounds, I think, forwards in, in gaining credibility for Qigong practice. You, you know what I think a big problem is, Gary? It's that in, in modern Qigong since since 50, 55 or 56, yes, yeah, 50, they, yeah. they really have had um uh, by the way, I love modern Qigong, but I'm not I'm not criticizing the practice at all. But there's really been a strong emphasis on the practices. Like the, you know, you do your breath stuff, you do your body mm -hmm. stuff, you do your mental stuff. And in older times, um, what we call Qigong today was often branded under the term Yangsheng, which means life nurturing. Mm -hmm. And really what that's about is modifying your lifestyle. And those practices are part of yes, exactly. modifying your lifestyle. So today, people who practice Qigong, especially, I can't say especially in only in the West, but this is a bigger problem, I think, in the West because there's a, a wall of cultural illiteracy surrounding Chinese stuff. And so they they think that all of the claims of Qigong are based on moving your body in a certain way, breathing in a certain way, putting your attention on a certain place. And in reality, it's never been like that. It's always been about part of a lifestyle, right? Yeah, always. And so, and that's the same for Western yep. wellness, not just fitness, but wellness. It has to be that way. You'll never, I say to pizza, people all the time, you'll never outrun a, a, a pizza on a treadmill. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's, it's true. true. A pizza has lots of calories if you eat the yeah. whole thing. Yep, <laughs> definitely true. Um, and and so then when, when people are practicing Qigong, then it must be really on your radar when you teach students that you have to, you have to facilitate for them the ability to discover something more than just moving. Is that right? Yeah, so again, it's it goes back to that holistic terminology, um, and what we were we've been discussing just a little bit beforehand as well before we came on camera, that the, there there is something I when we when I talk about wellness, there's the term fit and healthy. Oh, you look fit and healthy. I'm feeling fit and healthy. They're they're not the same thing. Um, so it's it's understanding that exactly what you say that qigong can be part of being fit and part of being healthy. But it's not it's not your only thing. And again, otherwise, we'd all just be doing Qigong and, and, and that would be it because it would have spread as soon as that kind of level of thinking. If it's if it's fact, then that's what we would all be doing. It is a it is a, a massive benefit to doing it as part of all your other things. Um, but as, as I say, from a sports science perspective, you've got so many different aspects of fitness. 
without even going into the healthy part and qigong itself once you've practiced for maybe three three months there's no more progressive resistance on your body gravity is the same and your body's relatively the same in three months so what was difficult for you at the beginning may not be so difficult for you now and that's great but unless you progress those practices you will plateau and become static and um, and for certain populations again there's nothing wrong with that because it's a challenge every day but for for a lot of people if you want to have the benefits continue then you have to integrate it as part of a as we talk about healthy diet as part of a, a mind body practice where you're becoming more mindful of everything that you eat everything that you do everything that you say hopefully <laughs> um so it becomes a much bigger picture and it's it has as, as i say it has great value when you you put it into that context um i've got a there, there's studies again that look at not just specifically qigong but mind practices on trauma victims and those that don't practice mind body versus those that do and and generally you can always show uh, an improvement by those that practice the mind body practice against those that maybe just hit the the gym for the same period of time so there's value and there's studies out there um it is difficult sometimes to get people to think beyond what they wish it was um oh especially but, people who have a financial interest in it a hundred percent, mate. As I say, it's <laughs> cognitive dissonance has it has uh, for all things in human endeavors. It has a lot to answer for. When it's your bread and butter, when it's your 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 golden goose, you're not gonna want to like deviate from that. When you've spent so much money learning a specific thing about it, you're not gonna want to deviate much from it because there's all these defense mechanisms that tell us, "Ooh, this is where you should be." Um, and it goes back to what we talked about in part one is, is opening your mind a wee bit, cross training different styles, look at different styles of Qigong even, and what their goal is and look for similarities, look for differences. And then, as I always say, look for the data, look for the, if anyone's done studies, even if it's anecdotal of just, I've got 10 students, here's how they were at the day one, here's how they feel now at the end of a session, can they stand for longer? Do they have better muscular endurance, cardiovascular fitness? All those aspects can point very specifically to uh, something that's working. Um, so I always encourage that. Again, there's studies out there, and um, if you if you dig deep, you you can find them. Not as many as a, as we would hope as qigong professionals, essentially. Um, but again, if if we can stop telling people that you can set things on fire with your qigong maybe <laughs> maybe we'd get some more credibility and more universities would start picking up studies i'm hearing a a, a lot of um a lot of rationality here gary i'm afraid <laughs> that we're in the minority but um so now i want to just shift it in a slightly different direction mm -hmm. here because i want to i want to also pick your mind about about a couple of things. Um, and one of them is, you know, students, students, advanced students and teachers practice differently. They have to practice mm -hmm. differently. And but I want to give people a view into uh the world of 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 you who practice Qigong for decades now. And so I want to ask you, without leading too much. When you practice, do you find that you end up emphasizing different parts of practice for different reasons at different times, or do you always practice the same way all the time? No, definitely the first one. Oh. Definitely. the the Because again, depending on how much detail you want to go into, and, and this just to go back to specifically the Dao Yin Yang Shingong system, th there's, there's, you know, there's a season for each organ system. There's a system of Qigong for each organ system. So at certain times when, particularly when I've been teaching classes like group exercise type classes or group classes, it's 
it's nice to give that framework and just say, well, it's springtime now. So we're going to start focusing on the liver. This is the, the regenerative time. It's pretty much in a, from a Western side, our only part of us that can regenerate to, to that degree, the liver cells themselves. So it almost goes very well together. Um, and like we, we were saying earlier, there are some of these similarities from old Western medical theories that tie into to traditional Chinese medical theories. So things like that, I try and work with the framework um, of teaching and, and I'll, by the, the virtue of that, there's uh, there, there's so many forms that you wanna practice sometimes what you're gonna teach so that you don't go into something. And I'm, I'm guilty of doing it when I've been teaching maybe the short Tai Chi 37 or 42 Yang and suddenly my brain is is switched to Tai Chi and I'll go into the like the hundred and I'll just keep going and everyone just looks at you. So there's, there's there's benefit to practice in what you're about to teach. So from that aspect, as a as an instructor, I'll often practice, you know, the liver forms in the springtime because I know I'm going to teach them. But for my personal practice, it it often depends on life in general. Like, do I have time to fit in the like the 49 dynamic meridian practice, which is a 25 minute practice, very, very static which I love it's if you don't know it, it's um in in China when we used it in China, it's it's known as the it's almost known as the magic form because uh it was one that we 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 used a lot for cancer patients and it, it showed us significant benefits in in various metrics for for dealing specifically with cancer. And it's one that the professor that Professor Jiang created with that goal in mind. So there's days where I will just be like, this is my form today. I just want to stand and just go like zone out into myself. Um, and then there's other times where I want that more dynamic practice of maybe a 10 minute form, which is movements and, and focus on the heart meridian and cooling that hot heart energy and balancing things out a little bit. And um, so it definitely, for me, I don't have a template of, of exactly this is how I'm going to practice. I really, it sometimes will be at the end of a, a, a brutal sing yi set where I just need to settle myself down and um, whether I've just done forms and hit the bag and hit the, the dummy for, for a while. And I need to just get, before I go back to real world, get back to, to a little bit more level. Um, but it has, again, it, it, having all these different ways of doing it has has value and again it's it's not to say that this way is is the best way some people as i say they they learn bad one jin mm. and they'll practice bad one jin forever and that's awesome as long as you understand that that's what you're doing and that that's your 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 purpose then there's nothing wrong with that at all um i've, I've said to people before that even even just certain movements from the the bad one Jin itself, looking at the history and the evolution of those movements, not much has changed in the purpose of it and in the physical nature of it. Um, so it has a has a really solid foundation for people, and I think it's a it's a, a really great practice. But again, if you want to go deeper into into the different modalities of qigong, then then start to practice them and start to to put them into your your lifestyle so that you you actually see benefits and it may not you may be like i cannot for, for certain students they cannot stand for any given time in the beginning so there's a you know there's the drill sergeant school of thought where you just make them do it and hope they come back next week or there's the more integrative way of thought of where you're like well let's see what we can get you to do that keeps you interested and motivated because that's as, as a teacher, you want to try and motivate your students. You don't necessarily want to be like, I'm going to hit you in the leg every time you you straighten up out your <laughs> horse stance because you saw in a movie one time. It's it's the, most people don't respond well to that. No, you, you have to you have to kind of modify teaching to relate to your students, I think. So having more methodology in doing that and having practiced yourself in different methods and understanding, well, that never really worked for me, but it might work for you, but also I understand why it doesn't work for you is, is valuable, I think, as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. I, and I want to pick up really quickly on what you mentioned about seasonal changes, yes. because I don't know, I don't know if you've if you've heard about it or or, or you thought about it this way, but an interesting finding in in uh, biomedical research is that like I, this isn't by the way this is considered to be sort of a corollary thing so they haven't they haven't indicated fully through research whether this is actually what the reason for this mm -hmm. but you know when people get sleepy during the springtime yes yeah you get like you, so apparently one of the one of the positive hy hypotheses for why that happens is because you know as you know during the winter there's less light in the environment so your your pineal gland produces less melatonin um, or it produces more melatonin, sorry. Yeah, so, you so it makes you, it makes you sleepier, right? Yeah. Which you know, I don't even want to go into the pineal gland. That's a terrible, horrible discussion. But the actual, you know, function of the pineal gland is for um, young young men. Uh, I think producing what testosterone before their testicles are well, completely. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It's like the the yeah. stimulation of of various things. But yes. But but yeah. especially as an adult with with uh, melatonin. So as the spring comes and the resident light in the environment increases, there's less melatonin, but then the body starts to go into hyperproduction of um, of uh, uh, dopamine and uh, endorphins and estrogen. Um, and apparently this added production of hormones in the body is very tiring because the body has to work really, really hard to develop them. And this is a lot of it may be the product actually of changing light phases in mm -hmm. the environment. And so some, some hypotheses have been put forward that this could be the reason for sp spring sleepiness. And so I think these old ideas from Chinese medicine, from Persian medicine, right, all the way back to the times of Galen uh, and before, they, they are describing something that they intuitively sense but they don't describe it perfectly because they're they're only viewing it from the perspective of of um a, 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 a like a view that they have rather than a, a systematic way of mm -hmm. studying it. But you can see that you know within the context of modern biomedicine, we still have many of these similar ideas. So I wonder when you when you integrate um let's say a modern materialist science view into a traditional practice, whether or not you find ways to 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 kind of mix the recipes and and bring out more of the taste of each of them through through that kind of view, or or whether you think that that kind of view is a little bit too too subjective and sketchy. No, I think I think you just you nailed it there with with saying things like um like hormone levels change based on many things, but seasons are what like again if you look in nature you'll see it. There's a reason that that things start happening in springtime from not just plants but animals as well um and it's you 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 know an animal may not have any sense of what this means what time it is but they understand nature and they understand their their like in in terms of their directive in terms of life and what they need they'll they'll go through with it from from a human perspective we obviously have that awareness a little more i think and in particular there's uh, like your theory about the the pineal gland and the hormone changes is one. I know I've also heard that in a more basic level, springtime brings allergies and people they they're they're fighting allergies and the the histamine production goes so high that one of the ways the body can try and correct that because histamine production is actually your body being efficient. It's meant to produce histamines. It's when it overproduces, so the body tries to to shut down almost. And that can also create the sleepiness. So there's a few things in there within the the hormone system itself. One of the great models is the negative feedback model, which um, basically it says once you produce so much of something, it switches that off. So you don't just keep producing testosterone, for example, or progesterone, whichever hormone it is. Um, and you can see that again. It, it's it's prevalent in Chinese medicine. It may come under a different name, but the theory of that rotational basis of creating something and then when you've created it enough it stops and that basically is our, our five elements creation cycle and destructive cycle so there's there's things when you start to understand the detail of, of both and again you don't have to st study medicine for seven years to get it just read a read a book about it but you'll start to see these similarities and theories that were proposed 
by either like Hippocrates years ago with his his, his theories on humors and how they they affect us, and then going back to like the the emperor's canon on on medicine and how those things affected people. So there's there's ways to bridge it, and I think it's like you say, I think it's it's about knowing a little bit enough about both to understand it. I would never say that it's 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 bad to have that understanding of both sides and um, then from there you then decide what you want to to, to dis disseminate out to students or, or at workshops and and discuss and um, but i think it's you can definitely see it in again not just western medicine as we have now in chinese medicine and all these ancient civilizations they had their own systems of medicine some dead on some like you know the, the use of mercury was was questionable at any given time i think but there's certain things that have worked and stayed and certain things that didn't and have gone for for a good reason um so the, looking at those things again it's about making that conceptual bridge that people can actually say well hey yeah i can see that in my practice i can see why it's in a uh, uh, second year medical practitioners textbook let's try and figure out you know why we have it and what it's it's good for yeah well and in a sense I, I kind of feel like when we do qigong practice or martial arts or whatever and we want to use different theoretical paradigms or um you know doctrine or whatever to to define things in a sense what what i think we are kind of trying to do is not necessarily to latch on to something which is absolutely true, but rather to illustrate the potential and the utility of the practice so that um, people have a, a kind of guide there to be able to, yeah. to, to send them toward what they could be getting from it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with that in mind, also that that's another topic, which I wonder if you could comment on where, when you, when you guide people toward an understanding of, of these practices, using any of the theoretical basis that you have. Um, do you ever have the mindset that um, that you have to verify or disverify things or do you think there's a flexibility there? and 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 as a as a additional part of the question, you see that Qigong goes too far frequently where people yes. take their theories too far. And so at what point is it does it become, dangerous to be flexible you know using so-called uh yeah open uh, yeah clever 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 means or whatever you call them right mm -hmm. yeah no that's a it's a good question so i think um there is like the, again the scientist in me always likes to to try and have a something to cite a, a study and from the dao and yang Qinggong perspective while we were while i was learning in china and then as I stayed in China afterwards, I, we worked uh, in rehabilitation centers. We worked within the local Chinese communities in hospitals and we went in and we were able to establish like, because it's a, it's an easy, it's an easy audience because you're almost, your foot's in the door basically. But you, we, we had studies that we did again, based on metrics, whether it was simple, like standing on one leg balance studies whether it was like the the back scratch so you have a metric that reaches like how far apart your fingertips are can they touch can they overlap are they six inches apart so we worked on various metrics on mobility um some on like uh biometrics like blood pressure taking and but again there's there's other factors that involve most of our people were were it was a uh as i say it was a a complementary or holistic approach. So maybe they were on meds also. So to define it as, well, it was just the Qigong that did this is sometimes not appropriate to assign that kind of level of, of success. Um, but you can say, as I say, anecdotally, you get get those stories where someone feels much better. Um, no, I think a, a term that I often use is non-scale victories. And the scale is something we stand on when we're looking at getting healthier or fitter there's so many things that happen beyond the scale the number is is it's sometimes very damaging but sometimes useful and understanding when it's each is important 
So we're looking at all these non-scale type victories that you're looking at uh, lifestyle improvements for people. Those are the things I like to try and share with students. Um, there's a point, as I said before, certain aspects where you say, do you feel better after doing this? And someone says, yes. And then that's that's all you need for that point in time is, is double thumbs up. Well done. Let's try it again next week and see if you can feel better again next week doing it the, the same thing or progressing. Um, like you said, there is a danger when, and I, I, I love to encourage open-mindedness, but there's a danger when, and this goes purely back to our credibility as Qigong practitioners, there's a danger when it becomes way more than it actually is. Um, and we've, we've discussed it, and I know that there's there's people that love to believe it, and who wouldn't? Um, the reality, again, is if someone could combust paper with their chi, they would be the most famous person in the world. Like, yeah, like yeah. hands down, there's there's no way around that. You would be literally a, an X man. You you'd be you can set stuff on fire. My goodness, that's that that like that level of ability. Who who wouldn't want to think that that's that's out there? Because I want to try and aspire to get it myself. But the physics involved in that, like the combustion point of paper, is like two hundred degrees warmer than it takes for your hand to melt. So, so there's, the, it, when you start to balance things out with physics, which is, is, uh, is valuable in itself, there's a point where you understand that, yeah, I, I understand why people wish this was true, but the danger again for us is that for everyone else looking from the outside in, th there's, there's no connection that that can give to those people. It's, 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 it's like watching, you know, Penn and Teller on a stage in Vegas and saying, yes, that's great. It has no connection to me to want to start practicing Qigong. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it, totally. It, it's just, it's, so that's the, that's where I feel like the, the danger is, is it is always trying to, like you said earlier, there's, there's a realistic view and staying grounded, which I'm pretty sure on day one is one of the Qigong principles. <laughs> <laughs> people tend to let go and, and start to slide a little bit but staying grounded not just physically or spiritually or, or chi gongily it's it's important to stay grounded from your outlook as well and and understand what what it is and what it can do um and that's not to say try experiment and try these things as i say experimentation is is where we get the data from um but always try and come from it from a, a different point of confirmational bias. Um, and this this goes back to something that we talked about a little bit before. When I first went out to, to China, I'd seen the videos of the people like, boom, chi blast, you fly 20 feet across the room. I'd seen the like VHS of the old masters doing it. And uh, I went out there with the specific goal to find this, not, not to discredit it, not to, to validate it but to find it in science the blazes out of it because i was my big focus in in western sports science or sports medicine was mechanics of movement and i was just fascinated as to what mechanics are involved in this minuscule movement which generates such a reaction and it just didn't didn't compute so i went out my way i searched like mo as we talked about last time most of the parks in beijing shanghai Guangzhou, Hong Kong, uh, Taizhou, up to Tianjin, out as far west as as um, Xiaha. And I was just looking for, and, and always a story of, yes, someone can do this, and never a, a, a proof reaction that it, it was actually replicable on myself or mm. any of the students that I had traveled with. Um, so I think it, it becomes a very dodgy road to go down when you you start to to come at it from a I, I'm looking for it because I believe in it so much and when it happens to you you're like yes I found it and um, try try and maintain that neutrality of of beliefs experience it for yourself and then start to look at what it's what it's doing for you as a, as a practitioner yeah hey you know if if you um if it, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. So that, that's what I, I say to some people, again, when they, 
and this goes back to the health and wellness side when someone comes and says hey i read about this this crash diet or this healthy cleanse and it's yeah. going to do all these things and the reality is again if if everyone would be doing that if if it was real and if it worked mm -hmm. There's no shortcuts in it. Um, it. Qigong particularly comes from work and practice, the same as as most other things that we try and do in life. Um, and it's it's healthy to to want to go down that journey. It's it, there's no there's no like oh well why would I want to when there's a shortcut? Because the journey is is part of the experience. I think for for a lot of people. Yeah, well, you know, a couple of things that came up in my mind while you were while you were describing these things. N number one is that a lot of people who are really true believers in this stuff, they approach qigong or martial arts from the perspective of being in a religion, but the religion doesn't have as many rules as a normal religion. Mm -hmm. So you get to keep, you know, the parts of you that are not so well cultivated, you can let those slide because you have this belief in a supernatural power which, which, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people invest a lot of faith in. And then the other thing uh, that came to mind is that when people, they invest themselves so much in fast ways to do things, it's also something where like, yeah, you can keep smoking, you can keep drinking, you can keep eating all kinds of processed sugar and everything that you want because this one thing is going to fix the problem for you. But yes. the, the reality of our lives is that we're very complex beings. Mm -hmm. And and not only that, but even if you have uh, uh, innate understanding, um, you know, of what your correct intake of macronutrients and micronutrients and all these things are, you still have to do all the cooking for yourself. You still have to know, you know, what to put into yourself when. And you're going to come into conflict with even the best of lifestyles because you don't always need the same thing every time. Right. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. so, so that's from my perspective and you can tell me what you think about this. I find that it's one of the points that I find the most value in talking to, to students about because a lot of the time, maybe they haven't thought about those things. So, so do you, when you teach Qigong, cause some people just teach, uh, you know, what they purport to teach and other people are teaching a more encompassing kind of view. I suspect that you're probably helping people a lot to, to understand not their lives, but maybe how they can learn about their lives. And can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, hopefully. And this, this goes back to like that, that mind body connection to, to understand. Um, in in various aspects, it's definitely out there. The, um, and just to go back before we go into this discussion, you can do all those things. You can do your qigong. You can eat well. You can live the, the, the best you can, and you'll still catch a cold. Yeah. Like you say, we're we're incredibly complex as, as a system. If you break it down into systems, if a, a cold virus gets in you, your body's still going to try and fight it, but you may still catch it. You may be slightly higher likelihood that you won't, but you absolutely still can. So there's no... There's no bulletproof vest to Qigong. There's no like, that's it. I'm in a bubble now and it's it's going to protect me from everything. Um, and again, as long as you understand that, I think when people sometimes see it and, and pitch it as as this thing, and then someone comes to class and like, well, uh, you weren't here last week. You were sick. So this isn't working. So why am I doing it? If you let them know from the outset that it's a it's a big picture thing, it's a complex based on on many different things. Then I think you you start to make it you make it more tangible for people. With regards to um, like having people look a little bit inside, sometimes yes, and and I'll refer back to specifically the the program that I developed for for people. Um, again, it's it's a term that that's used for people BMI of thirty five and up. It's morbidly obese, and we were specifically working with people with one or more comorbidities. So this was either they had potentially diabetes or they potentially had heart disease on top or high or hypertension bringing them to to a qigong practice and slowing down and, and again just something that was making them aware of i want you to just stop for a minute and try and focus on yong chuan and they're like well what does that mean and you explain where yong chuan point is on the sole of the foot and without even going into the connection with the kidneys without co connecting it to the the bubbling well or the spring 
the onsen as I like to call it because I love my onsen um, <laughs> it's it's just putting their mind to a, a distal point and suddenly they're like oh and it breaks down a, 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 a sometimes a very rigid structure of of a mentality that's that's grown for for years and um, so there's a definite value to to that and having people for for in that particular um program that we were working on to have people become aware of that they are more than just a, a say a number on a scale they're more than just what society views them as um then it has power and that's just one example it, it, and it it kind of is the same for anyone who's just coming in off the street, has no discernible health issues, but they, they've heard about Qigong and they're interested to do it. Um, that kind of slowing things down and it's it's almost like an internal reflection, but it, it's just a byproduct of the practice. It's not like I want you to really focus on your inner self. It's It almost becomes part of the practice just purely by doing the practice, which I think is is one of the real values of Qigong. Um, and it has, as I say, it has benefits, can be from day one for some people. It can be on day 20. It can be like two years down the line when someone makes that connection. But as long as, again, as long as you can keep that student motivated to, to try and keep learning, then I think you're you're doing your job. And it's, and it's I say, it's, you don't catch everyone in the net. You have some people that will try it and be like, loved it, but it's not for me. Thanks very much. And that's okay. It's not all oh, well. I failed. It's 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 purely based on what someone is comfortable doing, and uh, you've got to try and keep them in there. I think I may have lost you there for a wee minute. Yeah, yeah. One of us, one of us cut out. Um, yeah. So we'll see whether or not it makes it onto the recording. But basically, <laughs> to to summarize, what as far as I got uh, was that basically people will come in, and uh, it takes them a different period of time to obtain the benefit from the practice, and it's not for everybody. But the the key point is that you want to make sure. Uh, a subliminal element to the practice which gradually guides them in the right direction is that more or less yeah i think as i say i think there's 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 all these awesome like byproducts i call them of of the practice and it it happens it's part of the nature of qigong it happens almost naturally with the practice and some of it is is conscious and some of it is just what's going to happen and it's not it's not peculiar or specific to qigong it's it's one of those things that if you go out for a walk every day, the, there's more benefits beyond you just walking and getting some cardiovascular benefit or muscular endurance benefit. There's benefits to seeing what's out there in the world. There's benefits to saying hello to the person, the postman that you, you happen to see every morning or whatever it is, there's benefits that go beyond what you thought it was going to be. And I, I think, again, for me, one of the great things about Qigong is a lot of them happen organically because of the nature of the practice. Um, and it's, it's again, it's it's proven for me working in the clinics, but also going back however long you want to go back. I mean, again, the the, the history, and I encourage people to is your is your blog still up? I encourage people to read your blogs because <laughs> you because you don't just come at it from this is what I was told. You come at it from well, I've read this is the research. This is the research. But when you're coming at it from a historical point of view, you've got like a couple of thousand years, at least of good references. When you start saying there's 10,000 years of references, then it, it it becomes a little sketchy because I certainly don't, haven't read any books that are 10,000 years old on Qigong. Um, but if, if you can, if you can see that benefit for that amount of time, there's, you know, it's one of those things that it's, if, if if it's still around in a in a relatively similar form then it's there's value to it and again it's there's the arguments that it was all diluted and changed um as we said earlier the 50s really was when i think it was um 
Liu Guizhen wrote a, a, a book or a treatise like Qigong therapy in the 50s, mm -hmm. and he coined the phrase Qigong basically um, as, as a health practice. I think there was mentioned in the, the, you might know better, the Jin dynasty way back, but it never related to health practices specifically. Um, so it, understanding that it's become this from that point forwards, but there's still value to it. Like the, the Chinese Health Qigong Association, they still have a Qigong practice. They keep it very much almost like a trade. It's, it's trademarked and it has to be this way to be this, to be called that. But you're still getting Qigong out of it. So as long as you understand that this is my practice, but maybe, you know, there's there's other practices out there. Um, there's still benefit to it. So it's it's one of, like you said, throwing the, the baby out of the bathwater. It's one of those things where you understand what's good to keep and what's not. Yeah, sure. Every every generation has its own unique uh, strengths and, and weaknesses, and we're yeah. not any different than any other preceding generation. 100%. 100%. Uh, yeah. Except one thing that I would add is that I think that those people that say Qigong after the 1950s are watered down really don't have any idea what Qigong is <laughs> because uh, really, you know, after the 1950s, it went into an incredible state of development. Uh, but the the problem with it, of course, is when anything develops very quickly, it, it often ends up encompassing a lot of things that you try a lot of different things and, and some of them work and some of them don't work. You know? Yes. Yeah. It's it's a hundred percent, and and it is it's it's one of those concept misconceptions that, like at that point, it, it did become this watered down government sponsored program, of, and it it really wasn't the case at all. Or um, in one particular instance, when the the Falun Gong, um, leader, like I was in China practicing at the time and and living there, and when he stood up and said, "All my practitioners, make yourself known." because Falun Gong has that spiritual aspect and under communist rule, there was no freedom of religion. Essentially there was a clamp down on that aspect of Qigong. Now, some people believe that all Qigong was cleansed at that point as well. And this was like 1999, I think the late nineties, it wasn't like before we had a connection with, with China. And yes, the, the government did crack down on that one aspect because the, we're not comfortable with the the religious or spiritual side of it of that that particular aspect, um. But there was medical qigong was still vastly used in in the clinics and the hospitals. There was it, most of the universities had medical qigong centers where, like you say, they were still trying to develop what worked and maybe move away from what hadn't worked or what wasn't working and still um develop it. And in a lot of the universities in particular. We're trying to connect it with the, the the Western side, whether it was for sports injury rehab in particular, because you have athletes who injure out often. So using something like the red cord Norwegian system for rehab, coupled with uh, whether the bad one gin for mobility, and then you have a really solid foundation to to build on. So yeah, there's there's this conception in the the West often that it it was there's various points of cleansing. <laughs> It, that just didn't happen because like you say it's it's understanding what it was originally and what it is now and there's 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 still so much like the Dao and yangshen practices it's all still about leading and guiding the chi the blood it's all about that health nourishment it's they're not different yeah yeah well exactly i mean in the in the long run ultimately what most of the people who create new qigong cells do in, including in the beginning of the genre of Qigong in the 50s, all the way up until now, is that they'll look back at different layers of the historical practices, including, like, usually they'll have a transmission from a teacher, but then including older documents and archaeological findings. And however talented they are at combining the ideas that they want to combine, then they, they'll come up with something which is either very subtle and very wonderful, or, you know, maybe not so subtle and wonderful, but mm -hmm. it's... Um, it's it's always been like that since the inception of this stuff. It's people learning from past generations and trying to improve it in the future. That's yeah. that's how it is. And now we have a very rich base of knowledge to stand on, which has not only, let's say, 2,000 to 2,500 years of traditional material, but also this recent flourishing, maybe which has been happening since the 19th century, of a, a gradual mixing of, of biomedicine 
uh, and other types of uh, materialist science with with traditional knowledge. It's it's marvelous, actually. It is. It's a it is a good time, as I say. Like being in this from from like the the sort of mid to late eighties when I started studying qigong, and then seeing the the willingness of more and more Western integration or Western minds to integrate qigong. It's uh, it it does you good to to understand because again we as practitioners you're like well I, I get the benefits of it how do I get it to anyone else and you can have your class and that's great but if from a medical specifically side if you can have it as a an integrative health practice then it can really start to 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 show people what it can do and I think as I, as I go back to like the the CDC programs that are either using uh, tai Chi or, or incorporating aspects of, of Qigong or even acupuncture, which is widely used now, but 30 years ago, no one would touch it in, outside of traditional Chinese medicine. It's it's pretty cool to see. Um, and like you say, the information perspective is, is, I think that's driven it as a part of, there's more studies being done. The more studies that show positive effect, more studies will be done. And from that, the, the hope is that they show again, like the, the positive effects. So then more money and more dollars will, will get assigned to those things. It, 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 on a basic level, it works the same as everything else, whether it's food science or um, pharmaceutical science, it's all based on like what the benefits are. And this is a, a, another random thing. The pharma, this is like going back to the pharmaceutical industry there's 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 this theory that well they they keep qigong out of everything because they want everyone to to use their their drugs one of the the programs i worked with um specifically we work with pfizer um and they have an agenda but they're also not like just about they're not like discounting every other modality of wellness to push drugs or or vaccines it's a very Again, it's I understand it because there's so much money involved, but the reality of being on the ground and being involved in 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 practicing it is there's some great collaborations out there that are happening and could potentially happen, as long as we are open to understand you know what what that means for us as as qigong professionals. Sure, you know the the, the thing is, Gary, I really I feel strongly about this because I work in the acupuncture field, mm -hmm. and within acupuncture. Oh, I don't know if I can say this or not, but hopefully I can. Hopefully I can say this. Um, I have certain, you know, restrictions placed on me by my my professional college, but I think it's fair to say this. There is a a lot of people in the acupuncture field, and then generally in the alternative health field, who have a conspiratorial view of of modern medicine, and so anything that they can latch onto to create an enemy for themselves in order to define what's good about themselves, uh, they'll do, even though it's completely irrational. Who wouldn't want to have better outcomes for diabetes? Because those people who have diabetes, they are going to take medicine either way mm -hmm. if they have if their diabetes is severe enough. And so the idea that you could get them to to live longer and have better life if you incorporate some other lifestyle practices together. If you if you go to your general practitioner, right, your family doctor, whether you're on medication or not, any general doctor who is worth their salt will tell you, you have to make sure to pay attention to your lifestyle, which includes exercise, which includes proper diet, mm -hmm. sleep, yes, uh, yeah. and, and time management, your relationships. And they'll give you advice, go take a yoga class, go take a Qigong class. My uh, doctor, when I was younger, he religiously ran and did yoga every day, and he would suggest it to, to his patients. And so I have very, very little you know, patience for this conspiratorial view that people take where it's big pharma. What do you know about big pharma? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. If if you're on the ground working in the programs, you you know, you start to understand that it's a collaborative effort. Um, and yeah, like you say, what it it's not like there's not there's not this view of like let's keep everyone in need. Like that's no. not where where we are. It's specifically, like you say, for for diabetes, if you're on metformin. There's a point where um, there's a certain dose plus exercise that will give you your best outcome for your, your blood glucose levels. If you take away the exercise, then generally you're upping a dose. 
and that's fine if if that's if you if you're at a point where you cannot exercise and you need the 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 drugs then absolutely fine but like you say there's a point where two things can help you so why on earth and and, and it's been my experience that no one has said no 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 don't have this stuff that can help you only this stuff because this is what's putting money in my pocket i've i've never met in, in my time, someone that has that way of thinking, it's not to say that they, it doesn't exist. I'm sure someone somewhere maybe is rubbing their, their fingers together all the time. But oh, you know who I you know who I think it is, Gary. I think it's I think it's some of the people that are selling supplements. Well, th yeah. Th so supplements are a whole other thing. Like there's no FDA. I, I, by people. the way, like I'm not dissing supplements at all. No, no, no. There, there's I'm just saying, you know, there. That's where you see it, though. Like I, as for from the Qigong perspective. Um, I heard a story about somebody who went to visit a Qigong practitioner while they were receiving chemo. Mm -hmm. And the practitioner said, stop taking chemo and just do yeah. Qigong. It, that's horrible. You, it's you terrible. Know. It's it's almost a death sentence for a lot of people. Crazy. Um, and again, it's what discredits us. And I've, I've had the same conversations, as I, as I said earlier, with really like taking someone heels together when they say, oh, skip your medicine today, let's do Qigong. That's that's never the way. Even if you're a doctor, it's never the way because that person, as a patient, like you say, has is a whole world. It's not just that one thing that you're looking at that defines that person. Um, so yeah, it's it's a from a Qigong perspective, as I say, that it's the one aspect that I think has kept us as as practitioners, professionals, out of of talks out of collaborations with with clinics that we could have been doing so much good for the last 20 30 years um, and and it's based on again it's based on people within our community who who peddle the 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 lines that this is what you need this is the the only thing you'll need and it's always a reference to that one person it's like well i've worked with this one person and they it's like well a sample study of one uh, in, in terms of, of, of data is like a sample. Yeah. Ideally you're, you're looking at hundreds and you're looking at a control group who don't do Qigong and a, a group who do Qigong and a, another group who maybe does a different modality of exercise. So th these are when we'll get the data in and these are where we'll get the credibility from. Um, yeah. And it, it, again, it's, it's not, it'll help the qigong world that will help the qigong profile in the world but for many of us we'll keep going on anyway we'll carry on regardless yeah yeah because i for me it's it's one thing that i've seen have benefit and it's one thing that i that i enjoy doing so 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 there we go okay i want to just mention that one of the things that we're trying to do at dao e is not just to interview people but it's also to learn something about the respective practices that we're promoting. So, you know, we all practice whatever, Qigong, martial arts, Taoism, or or Chinese medicine or, or whatever. Taoism has a pretty big umbrella. And what we're what we're trying to do here is when we talk to people in the community, it's so that we can have these kind of discussions where we find out, hey, you know what? There's this problem of perception because that's caused by a certain attitude. And when we can find things out like that, then in the future, as a community, we can make improvements and we can start to make these things that we do really become powerful uh, and helpful beyond our communities in the in the broader sense. So I think that what we'll do is we'll we'll start to wrap down the interview. Mm -hmm. But do you have anything that you would like to mention that you think is of of great importance relative to to what you're doing and, and your voice in the community? I think I think you touched on it a little bit there. It's to to try and make it accessible for for anyone and everyone. That's that's the key. Um, the benefits we know as practitioners, the benefits of acupuncture, you know, as someone who sticks needles in, and you understand the the goal and what the the ultimate result is. Um, I think if we can create something that's accessible for everyone, and that means sometimes, as I say, reining ourselves in a little bit to make it like appealing to some to someone else or to, to, to let them try and understand it. Even though we may talk passionately about it, you may lose someone instantly. 
um, just based on what you say to them, because that's not what they're looking for. Um, so trying to, to keep that, that broad base of knowledge so that you can try and get to as many, many interested parties as possible, I think is, is what's going to help us. Um, and, and I always, I hear this thing often, the question of why is, does yoga have so much, a much greater following than Qigong? And I think yoga didn't, they, they don't go into like, like, oh, well, this is the only way to do it. Or this, check this out. Look what I can do with my yoga. I can, I can levitate or it's like Dalsim from, from Street Fighter 2. He can throw fire. The, the Qigong, like you said earlier, it, it's so many things to so many people now that they become very insular in their world of Qigong. I think if we can break down some of those barriers within our own community, then it will actually welcome more people in um, and, and try different types of Qigong, you know, try different systems. Look online, there's a, a vast uh, amount just on YouTube alone on the different systems um, and find what, what works for you. And again, in, as a teacher, encourage people to 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 do that. Um, if if we just encourage people to stay in your class, like no, no, you stay in my class. There, this is what you need. Is is all right here. There's two. There's there's the people that are going to believe it and will like come to your class religiously forever, and there's the people that that will send up red flags to. Um, so I think trying to trying to hit that sometimes like we talked about in part one with the martial arts practice, hit that middle of the road where you're you're trying to welcome everyone in and try and listen to them as much as you want them to listen to you so that you understand what it is that they're trying to get out of a practice and then tailor it to 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 help them. Awesome. Thank you very much, Gary. Can you also please remind our viewers where to find you? Yeah, so YouTube again, like, like going back to what we said earlier, YouTube is my my channel of choice right now. Um, I have a lot of Qigong content on there, a lot of um different information, forms information, and it's all free. I, I like other than YouTube charging me ads or, or or playing ads on my stuff. I don't really care. I'm not in, in that aspect to to have passive income. I just wanted to, particularly when COVID happened. I wanted to just put as much Qigong out into the world as I could and also get it out of my brain because I was like, oh, I can, Qigong can help with this and that. Um, so White Orchid Kung Fu, school t-shirt there promo, um, on uh, YouTube is where everything is. My website, as I mentioned before, I was I was hosted by uh, GoDaddy. They, they messed up the hosting and... Uh, so I wasn't entirely happy. So I took it off of them. So I'm, I've still got the website built, but I'm just looking potentially for a new host right now. But yeah, go to go to YouTube and look for White Orchid Kung Fu or Daoyan Yang Shen Gong for the Qi Gong side. There's me plus there's other practitioners out there uh, doing this. Um, and that's probably the easiest way. There's an email address linked on there if anyone... I, I, I try and always answer questions. I try and always debate points um coming at it from from a, a standpoint of unconfirmational bias so always happy to to get into this as we can look at the clock and see <laughs> i'll bore you to <laughs> tears with this um but yeah that's where you can find me all right thank you very much gary uh, please so stick around me. for for a moment i'm just gonna do the uh the outro yeah so you you hear, heard it here guys uh gary bickett and his excellent ideas about qigong um, we can look at this thing objectively and we can understand it through multiple lenses, but it's very, very important that we maintain a sense of uh, objectivity and skepticism and uh, don't, don't get too infatuated with mystical and magical things because what you can actually do with these arts is very real with real benefits, but you have to pay attention not only to the practice, but also to the rest of your life. That's it for this episode, and we'll see you in the next one.